Welcome to the Silliman Lecture. My name is Mary Louise Timmermans from the Geology and Geophysics Department. And before I get started introducing our speaker today, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on the Silliman Lecture. The Mrs. Hepsa Eli Silliman Memorial Lecture Series is the oldest at Yale. It was established in 1901 at the bequest of her children. The annual lectureship was laid out for lectures that, quote, illustrate the presence and wisdom of God as manifested in the natural and moral world, and that subjects should be selected from the domains of natural science and history, with special prominence given to astronomy, chemistry, geology, and anatomy. The first lecturer in 1902 was the physicist and Nobel laureate J.J. Thompson, who was credited with the discovery of the electron. Since then, Silliman lectures have gone on to include Ernest Rutherford, Niels Bohr, Enrico Fermi, and a long list of others. The 1910 Silliman lecture was Svante Arrhenius, who won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry and may be less familiar to some of you. Of relevance to, to today's lecture is that Arrhenius was the first person to use principles of physical chemistry to quantify the extent to which the increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide influence the Earth's temperature. His paper came out in 1896. So around 120 years later, we find ourselves here at sea level rise, inconvenient or unmanageable. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's Silliman lecturer, Professor Richard Alley. Professor Alley is the Evan Pugh Professor of Geosciences at Penn State University. He's world renowned for his research advances in glaciology, ice and climate, sea level change, and abrupt climate change. He's published over 200 highly cited papers on these topics. Professor Alley has many awards and honors, including election to the National Academy of Sciences, and he's also an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was elected a foreign member of the Royal Society, in part for his outstanding contributions to the study of ice, its interactions with the landscape, and its link to climate. His other awards include the Heinz Award, the Seligman Crystal, the Wollaston Medal of the Geological Society of London, and the National Center for Science Education Friend of the Planet Award. Notably also, Richard was a scientific contributor to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. So let's welcome Professor Alley. Oh dear, thank you. It, it is an honor and a privilege to be back at Yale. It's been a couple years since I was here, and it, it, it is truly, truly great to see you here. I, I want to, John Wetlaufer is an old friend, Mary Louise is a new friend, and, um, and Margaret set it up so I could get here and, and reserve the plane ticket and so on. So I'm going to walk you through uh, what I hope is an interesting story. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of big background, and I'm going to use gratuitous penguins. Um, we, the penguins don't have anything to do with this, but they're fun. So, so at any rate, I like, I've been to Antarctica four times, Greenland nine, so, so I do this stuff. And so we're going to do some big picture with penguins, then I'm going to do a little economics, then I'm going to do a lot of ice sheets, and then I'll, I'll close with something. Okay? So uh, probably no one in this room needs this little bit, but some of your neighbors might. Okay, and I think that we need to go back to basics a little bit on certain things. So the idea that, that we are here because we were cured by scientific medicine, or our parents or our grandparents were, uh, that I flew up here on an airplane that was designed on a computer, and it flew the first time it was tried, and it's still flying. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with this anymore. There's a nice lady in here. She tells me where to go, and I go there. And she's canoodling with Albert Einstein because she knows where she is because she has a GPS. And that GPS actually does use relativity. And if it didn't, it would dump me in the bay out here in a little bit, the sound. Um, and it's got quantum mechanics in there. And what is it? This is a fascinating thing. Go into a fifth grade class and say, what is it? And they'll say, it's your cell phone. And you say, what's it made of? 
Uh, cell phone parts? Right, what's it made of? It's a little bit of sand for the, the glass and the silicon and the chip, and it's a little bit of oil for the plastic, and it's the right rocks, the ones with the rare earth elements and the palladium and so on. And that's all it is, is sand and oil and rocks, and science and engineering and a little design and marketing. And, you know, if you talk the sand and oil and the rocks and you went down to the Senate and said, here's a do-it-yourself cell phone kit, <laughs> right? The, the randomly typing monkeys are going to produce Shakespeare before they produce a cell phone. <laughs> but we have a whole lot of fellow citizens who will take this and send me an email that says, you scientists don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. right, so <laughs> it is also worth pointing out, remembering that science does advance. And yes, that cell phone uses relativity and it uses quantum mechanics. A, a philosopher or sociologist of science uses a computer that, that uses quantum mechanics, but they work in a building that was designed with Newtonian physics. And that airplane wing was designed with Newtonian physics. And when I model a glacier, I do not write a quantum wave function, nor do I make a relativistic calculation for the velocity of the glacier, I use Newton. And in fact, to the best of my knowledge, we have never taken the useful parts of a major body of science that's real science and thrown them away. And when you meet the person who says, oh, you scientists always change your mind, they're doing that in a building that was designed with Newton. Now, I'm going to go to energy for a little bit. Okay, we had some really good pizza down over here today at lunch, and we're going out to dinner, and I have a nagging suspicion I will be over my 2,000 calories today. But in round numbers, a human diet is 2,000 calories per person per day. That's the equivalent of 100 watts. Right, so, so I, what you can do, all the brilliance that you do is the equivalent of one bright old light bulb, right? And if I actually had to make the light work by riding a bicycle to make electricity, I'd be out of breath because that's sort of all I can do. But I flew up here and the building is heated and the building is lighted and, and I did not have to spend all summer hoeing corn so I don't starve to death this winter. In round numbers, the energy use in the United States economy per person is about 200,000 calories per day. It's a little more than that. So what I can do is one, what is done for me is 100. Right? 10,000 watts take care of me. And I love this. Don't kid anybody. It's great. But right now, it's about 83% fossil fuel. Right? So we live well because of fossil fuels. Um, and that's going to change the climate. And climate science is old and it is well established. Uh, the lady in my phone can, can pull signals out of the air in part because there's filters in here that go back to Fourier. Fourier is the first one that figured out the surface of the earth is a little warmer than it should be. Maybe there's something acting like a greenhouse, 1829. Identification of CO2 as a player in this is Tyndall, 1859. Mary Louise mentioned uh, Arrhenius, 1896. He basically got it right. This is all pre-quantum. Making it quantum, a lot of it was done by the Air Force up the road at Hanscom Air Force Base here right after World War II. They were doing things like sensors on heat-seeking missiles. And CO2 absorbs infrared, whether it comes from the hot exhaust of an enemy bomber or whether it comes from the sun-warmed earth. And this is just physics. And there's really nothing beyond that. What Arrhenius missed was really how good oil and coal companies would be at giving us what we ask for. Arrhenius got the calculation more or less right and then said, now we'll never burn that much. Right? The amount of stuff that we burn is fantastic. All of those coal trains are full of stuff. And when you burn it, it's still stuff. And here's the scaling. You know what trash looks like. You can see that. 
Per person per year in the United States, we throw away at the curb for the trash collector about a half a ton. Right? So 1,000 pounds of trash per person per year at the curb for trash collectors. Our share of the CO2 in the U.S. economy is about 19 tons. Half a ton of trash, 19 tons of CO2. Okay? And this is changing climate. And I could give you that talk if you want. I teach the class. I helped a little bit in things on this. But, but this is happening, and it has impacts, and it will affect us, and it's going to get worse over time. We have really good scholarship that says if we use that with commitment to doing it right, with respect from where we came from, that not only is it ethical and environmental, not only does it help national security and employment, but it also helps the economy. Using this knowledge helps the economy. Right? And that's really important. And we actually know that with really high confidence. Now, I am not an economist. Okay? I understand that, that Bill is on the road. A whole lot of what matters in this field was done by, by Bill Nordhaus, who's here at Yale. Um, the fact that he hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet is just a travesty in my personal opinion. He's fantastic. He is a towering figure. Um, but I'm going to do a little economics for you. Because I spent a lot of my life studying changing ice, studying changing climate, learning what we could do to the world, and having people say, oh, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because of economics. And so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of why people keep telling me that I'm wasting my time. And then I hope in the end I'm going to show you that I'm not, and that we can use this knowledge to be even more valuable than we thought. So I'm going to very briefly review some economics, and then I'm going to take you through some ice sheet collapse before we quit. Okay? So if you go and say the, the scholarship which says using this knowledge makes us better off has in it integrated assessment models of the kind that, that, that Nordhaus put together, and those models have built into them a few things. Probably the big one, the one that dominates everything, is that economic growth is virtually assured. The economy will grow. If we cause damages from fossil fuel CO2, that may slow it down a little, but not a lot. The economy will grow. Okay? A big economy lets people in the future solve any problems that we leave them. If it gets hot, they can have air conditioners. If sea level rises, they can use bulldozers to make walls. A big economy solves problems. Now, there's a couple of others that are less important, but they're in there. Your grandchildren are going to be so much richer than you that you don't want to sacrifice too much now because it takes money from you who are poor and gives it to them who are rich. And you, people have watched you, people have watched us, people have watched our political process, and we act like we're a little more important than our grandkids. Those are probably not as important. And then there's a couple more down here. Society will respond efficiently when challenged. Um, and we know what the economy will do. We know what nature will do. Okay? So this is what goes into a model which comes out and says, using our knowledge makes us better off. All right. So the thing is, most of the damages from our CO2 are in the future. If we put up a lot of CO2, it will take nature sort of a half a million years to get that down. It will have big effects for 10,000 years. We are changing the climate for time scales that are long compared to the history of civilization. Okay. But the long term is really not important in economic modeling because the growth of the economy lets you solve problems. And so what happens is that the future is, economic, is exponentially discounted to the present. Far in the future problems are not a big deal now because far in the future the big economy will solve them. And under the usual sort of assumptions, the usual numbers that are used, sort of the next 30 years matters and not too much after that. Now, it's not a cliff at 30 years, it's some exponential decay, but sort of think that we're worried about heading off the climate changes for the next 30 years from our CO2, and after that, we're not too worried about it. Right? 
And if you really think the economy is going to grow fast, maybe you are only about 15 years. But if you think the economy is going to grow slow, maybe you worry about 100 years. And that difference is going to prove to be why, ultimately, we need to know about sea level rise. Okay. So how they do this, then, is to put this into numbers. And they say, what is the present value, what is the present cost of the future damages it will cause by releasing CO2, changing the climate, melting the ice sheets, and so on? And they call that the social cost of carbon. What is the cost of society of the CO2 that I'm releasing? And a recent US estimate per US ton was $33. So my share of the CO2, 19 tons, times $33 is 600 bucks a year of damage that's done to society that's not in the cost of the fossil fuel. Right? Now, there are, there are other estimates of this. There was this survey recently that says $115 a ton, in which case I'm responsible for hurting the society by $2,200 a year with my CO2, and each of you is too. So, um, so this is sort of the way one, one turns this into a number. Right? And what it says is more or less this. The social cost of carbon is the present value of the future damages. But you could think of it as a subsidy for fossil fuels because they're allowed to hurt the society and that's not included in the price. We pay for the good we get, we don't pay for the bad we cost. And so you could think of that as, as a subsidy. You also could think of that as the profit that is waiting for society if we make good policies or we invent new things. And in all the studies I know of, every one that's now standing in the IPCC picture, there is a social cost of carbon. And that in turn means we can help the economy with wise policies. And that's the really important thing. If you assume economic growth forever is not going to be hurt much, we're more important than our grandkids, you still end up saying dealing with global warming to reduce it will help the economy. Now, the International Monetary Fund has looked at this recently. Some other people have. The government is always sort of involved with everything big. So they're involved with renewables. They're involved with fossil fuels. The conclusion of these studies was that in the US and in the world, we subsidize fossil fuels much more than we subsidize renewables. And if you notice that a lot of modern policies do not take account of the social cost of carbon, then our policies act to accelerate global warming, but would we would be better off if our policies acted to slow global warming. And that's where we can improve. Okay? And, but we do include the social cost of carbon in some decision making. You will find, for example, this was a hearing uh, in February of this year that was looking at how could we lower the social cost of carbon so we would do less now. Primarily what they tried to do was to say, well, maybe we shouldn't count the damages to the world, but only the damages to us. And if each country only counts the damages that their own CO2 causes to themselves, then almost all the damages are not costed and you just go ahead and change the climate. Um, so there are efforts going on in the world today to try to lower the social cost of carbon. So you would do less now to head off global warming. Why would you really lower the social cost of carbon in a global analysis um, if you think the economy will grow really, really fast so that our, our kids can solve the problems rather than waiting for our grandkids, then you would do less now to head off warming. If you think we're really more important than our grandkids, um, or and I'm going to come back to this, if you're really certain you know what the economy and nature will do, then you don't work as hard now to slow warming, but you still work to slow warming. Okay? In all of these analyses, we're still hurting ourselves by not using this knowledge. However, if you're worried that the economy won't grow real fast, or if you think maybe we should give extra weight to future generations, or as I'm going to show, if you're uncertain about the economy, then you would do more now 
to slow global warming. You would work harder to reduce CO2 emissions. Okay. okay. So here is a little tiny analysis. This is simplistic, but it may be useful. Suppose that we know that that by releasing CO2 or something, we're going to cause $1,000 in damages in 100 years. And we have to choose. Do we put our money into growing the economy so our rich grandkids solve the problem, or do we invest now in stopping the problem? And the usual sort of numbers people use, you should invest up to 20 bucks to head off a $1,000 problem in 100 years. And if it costs more than $20 to stop that problem now, just put it in the economy and your grandkids will solve it and that's the better way forward. You invest, it grows, they're rich, they deal with it. So the, the usual number is, is something like that. And so uh, to solve a $1,000 problem in 100 years, 20 bucks. Now, you can lower, the, if you say, whoa, the economy's gonna grow hugely, so we're gonna discount it greatly. You could lower that 20 bucks down to a dollar. But if you say, whoa, maybe the economy will grow slowly, that 20 bucks becomes 370. Okay. And this is why I said uncertainty about the economy. Notice that 115 to 20 is not nearly as big as 20 to 370. Right? So this is something, if our economics is uncertain, it translates into do more now to slow warming. So if you don't trust that we've got it exactly right, you do more now to slow warming to reduce CO2 emissions. And you'll hear people say, oh, we're uncertain, shouldn't we just wait? There's your uncertainty, and the answer is no, you do more now. Right? And if this is the answer, all of a sudden, whether that's $1,000 from sea level rise or 10,000 is really important. And so all of a sudden, this says, don't worry beyond about 30 years. This says, wow, you better hire some scientists and figure out what's gonna happen. And so if we're uncertain about the economy, then our uncertainties about science are really important and we'd better know. Okay? So, I'm going to take you through one of the scientific uncertainties and show you what happens and how much better it could be to slow CO2 rise now to avoid something really bad. So that's where we're going to go. I could do lots of others. We can make, by late in this century, we can make the tropics in places uninhabitable for unprotected people. Um, you know, so there's other things, but I'm going to do sea level rise. Okay? So CO2 gets high. Um, high CO2 makes it warm, warm melts ice. So these are a few times in history. This is high CO2 hot, this is low CO2 cold, this is high sea level, this is low sea level. We're there. Suppose we do the simplest possible thing, we connect the dots, we take CO2 today, run it down to the line, run it over, and ask where 10% of humans live, if we keep CO2 high for a long time, in the past when CO2 has been this high for a long time, sea level has been higher than a lot of people. Okay, now that is not a prediction. It's not a projection, but boy, it's a good reason to understand what we're gonna do to the ice. Especially since in a high emissions world, we could disappear over here. We could crank up CO2 past that. Okay. Sea level rise, even a little bit might be important. So this is a commercial picture. Hurricane Gustav in New Orleans did not get over the levee. It stayed behind the levee. Um, even a little sea level rise there could be a big deal. But what we're gonna talk about is sea level rise out of this picture up that way. Okay. Sea level is rising. I spent a while dealing with people right here who wandered around saying, oh, you guys are lying, sea level rise stopped. They sort of shut up about there. Um, sea level is rising. Okay, these are good data. Um, but at this rate, it takes almost a century to rise a foot. Okay. But if I take that and squeeze it down, so that's the previous plot, and we show back to 1700, the rise is accelerating. And our decisions determine where it might go. However, 
as I'm going to show you, this may be well optimistic, and it's hard to make it pessimistic. So there's some chance of something going way up there. So again, economically, that feeds into the conclusion that dealing with this wisely is good. But there isn't too much panic. And the reason is, first of all, that they're going to use something like this for the rise. And second of all, they're going to assume that we are efficient. And let me walk you through efficiency for just a moment. Right? So, so you have a beautiful beach house. I'm not sure how you got such a beautiful beach house, but you sit on the beach and you drink Mai Tais and you watch the sun go down. And it's a great beach house, but you see the sea rising. So what do you do? You quit maintaining it. When the sea finally knocks over your beach house, it was just a hunk of junk. We didn't lose anything. And you bought the house behind him. And when he's out of the way, you have the beautiful view. The economy has not lost the view. All we lost was one unmaintained beach house. So the cost is just dirt cheap. Right? I have seen published estimates that the 100-year cost to all the United States of all sea level rise is less than the cost of Hurricane Katrina because we're efficient. Right? Now, even so, you still end up investing to head off climate change. We are still hurting ourselves by not using our knowledge. But, but you know, will we respond efficiently? I was teaching introductory geology before Katrina hit New Orleans. There may be a few folks in here who were too. I think every serious introductory geology course in America at some point said, you know, the sea is rising, New Orleans is sinking because it's built on a big pile of mud, the protective delta is eroding, the storms might be getting stronger, and that has implications for reservoir engineering. If the ocean goes up and the city goes down and the protection goes away, you're in deep doo-doo. And we all knew this. It was government documents, it was things that everyone had. So if we're really truly efficient, did this happen? But it did. So I think it is worth asking whether we're really as efficient as we think we are. Right? Um, I, I was at a meeting on the economics of sea level rise in costs and, and said, OK, the cost will be we're efficient. I said, what's the worst thing? Well, uh, we lose everything valuable near the ocean. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing would be, well, we pay a lot to build walls, keep the ocean out. We tell everyone they're safe. We build lots more valuable stuff. And now we've built valuable stuff, more valuable stuff, and walls, and then it goes under and we lose it all. And if you think that's crazy, you might have seen this. This was on NPR last year. Um, the new maps are like a bureaucratic magic trick. At the stroke of midnight, the federal government waved its wand, and Friday morning more than half of New Orleans woke up in a land safe from storms and flooding for insurance purposes. It's safe. You can go build now. You're, you're protected. Okay? So, <clears throat> so it is conceivable that maybe we won't be quite as efficient as we think, in which case you would tend to do more now to head off climate change. Right? Now, will the rise be slow, small, and expected is really the question, what will the ice sheets do? So right now, glaciers in the mountains are melting. That takes water out of the Alps and puts it in the ocean. But when the ocean rises about that much, there's no ice left in the mountains. The ocean is expanding because it's getting warmer, but that will take centuries, you know. Uh, whereas it's actually about 24 feet in Greenland and closer to 200 feet in Antarctica. Just on the same scale, if you know what the Lincoln Memorial looks like, um, if Greenland were to melt and you start the water there, the water is in Lincoln's lap. And if Antarctica melts, he's way underwater. This is, I should have put you on here, I'm sorry. But at, at any rate, this is less than Greenland. Less than Greenland. And Delaware is pretty screwed. You know, that's just what you tell. Washington, people laugh about Washington, but you know, it's, it's, it, this could matter. Superstorm Sandy, the biggest surge was a little under 13 feet, four meters. 
These are feet numbers, 8.9 feet there, 7.9 there, 7.9 there. Uh, this is less than West Antarctica, even that sort of West Antarctica. And this only stayed for a few hours. Right, so losing an ice sheet is more than Sandy for all the world's coasts essentially forever. Um, and you remember what Sandy did. It was a few hours of that sort of mattered. Okay. You're up here someplace. So yeah, just five feet. Nothing to it. Right? Okay. So, and, and you may see things like this. With, you know, carbon choices determine U.S. cities committed to futures below sea level. We burn it all. We could melt all the ice. But that's way in the future, we hope. Okay, so let me do our glaciology class for you. This is Kurt Coffey. Kurt started at Penn State. He's now a prof at Berkeley. He wrote the book in our field. And so I'm going to review glaciology for you really briefly and show you why we might have to worry about sea level rise being much higher and much faster than we're expecting. Okay. So this is my dear wife, her arm, and she is making a pancake. She's trying to make a pile, and what happens if you make a pile is it spreads under its own weight. Okay? That's the physics you need to know. Um, if you hold it back somewhere, it doesn't spread as fast. If you make it stronger, it doesn't spread as fast. If you put it on a bumpier or stickier bed, it doesn't spread as fast. And it sort of looks cool. Okay? So that's the basic physics, because what's an ice sheet? Snow falls, it piles up, it piles up, it piles up. We used to get mail from people who were terribly scared of this. The, the Antarctica and Greenland were going to grow and grow and grow, and the world was going to roll over. <laughs> it spreads under its own weight, like Cindy's pancake. Snow on top is connected by flow to melting or iceberg making at the sides. If it snows more, the pile gets bigger. The water came out of the ocean, and the ocean gets smaller. If it spreads faster to go melt or break off, the pile gets smaller, and the ocean gets bigger. So that's the essential physics, a spreading pile. And we worry about strength, and we worry about lubrication, and we worry about spatulas holding it back. So let me show you a little bit about lubrication. The edge of Greenland, where it flows on the waffle iron underneath, sometimes gets little hollows in it. And where it melts, those hollows get water. And this is a lake, and it's a couple of miles across, and it's 30 or 40 feet deep in the middle. And it's been growing. You can see where the streams were that have now been flooded by it. But it also has cracks under it. Water can wedge open cracks. So our, our former student and now colleague, Sarah Doss, who's down at Woods Hole, um, went up to study these things. And she was in a different lake. But fortunately, she was not on the lake in her boat when it broke through. Here she is in the lake. Okay, so she's in about there, except it's not there anymore. Because it went to the bottom through that. It was twice Niagara Falls for an hour. Okay? And it was dramatic, and big blocks were bouncing around, and, and, you know, and the, the glacier lurched up, and it went sideways, and there was seismicity, and it was all exciting. But the glacier didn't fall in the ocean. Here's air, here's ice. Sarah was in there where it drained through. And why didn't it fall in the ocean? Because it's a waffle iron. It's not a greased griddle. So that matters, but it doesn't matter a lot. But I'm going to come back to that, because Sarah's Lake really will, will tell us something. Okay. Spatula holds back the spreading pile. Here's another analogy of something that holds back the spreading pile. This building, you don't have to worry about the roof caving in and the walls bulging out, because it's strong. It's like that cooked pancake. And the Newtonian physicists who designed this knew what they were doing. You don't have to worry. But the people who built early Gothic cathedrals pushed this to the limit. And they had troubles with the walls bulging out and the roof caving in. And what did they do? They came up with the flying buttress. It does the spatula job of holding back the walls by taking the spreading tendency and deflecting it out. An ice sheet 
can have flying buttresses too. So here's the pile of ice. It's minus 50 up there. It's not going to melt. But if it's cold, it spreads down to the ocean. It spreads over the ocean, still attached. It runs aground and gets some friction. Or it sits in a bay and scrapes past the side and gets some friction. But this is almost melting, and this is melting. Okay. So what happens if you were a bad person and you wanted to hurt a Gothic cathedral, you might knock out the flying buttress. What happens if you knock out the flying buttress of an ice sheet? Right. So I'm going to show you because this happened. <clears throat> We're down here at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, right there. Um, this is 12 miles. Black is ocean. These little icebergs are immense. This is the Antarctic Peninsula with glaciers dripping down from it. And this is the flying buttress. It formed sort of 10,000 years ago as the ice sheet shrank from the Ice Age maximum. It sat there for 10,000 years as of January 31st, 2002. But you remember Sarah's Lake. See these blue things? Those, and remember, this is 12 miles. These are big lakes in the cracks. And you remember what Sarah's Lake did, right? So let me make the labels go away, and then I'll make the ice shelf go away. This is five weeks. And Sarah's Lake broke through, but it was sitting on top of a waffle iron, so it didn't fall in the ocean. This one just fell in the ocean, right? And this blue slushy, you could kayak through it. It's just broken up little bits of stuff. Now, this was floating, so it didn't raise sea level directly. But you lost the friction. You lost the friction. And like losing a flying buttress, this thing sped up about eightfold. Now that raises sea level because that's ice that was not floating that's now going faster into the ocean float. Okay. Now fortunately, this didn't have much ice behind it. It can't raise sea level very much. So that one is just a, okay, it's a warning. This can happen. What we're worried about is these other ones that have lots of ice behind them. If this goes south, what happens? Let me show it to you one more time. We're going to do it in Greenland. We're going to come in along this yellow arrow and look at it. This is the ice sheet of Greenland. Snow on top spreads under its own weight out to the edge. Pieces of it go a little faster than other pieces, and we sometimes name them even though they're just in the other ice. And so right in here is Jakobsavn Glacier. It's just a piece of the ice sheet that goes fast. And it had a flying buttress. It had an ice shelf. The ocean warmed one degree. The ice shelf broke off. This was probably the fastest glacier on Earth, and then it tripled. And it took non-floating ice into the ocean, and that's contributing to sea level rise. Okay. So here's looking along that yellow arrow. Tundra is over here. Tundra is over here. This is a very deep fjord full of water with broken up ice on top. And the ice sheet is coming towards you way up at the top there. And I'm going to show you two pictures. One is here, the next one is there. The one here will show you that there is water under this broken up stuff here, because that's a seal. <laughs> they do oceanography with these. They put instrument packages on, they swim around under the ice, they come up, they telemeter what they observed, which is really cool. And then the seal was down here. This is the big pile spreading along. And this used to be filled with the flying buttress that's gone. And that's about 100 meters. That's a 30-story building. Um, and then below is about nine times more, because this is close to floating. So this is total about two-thirds of a mile. And there's the Lincoln Memorial again for scale. And the next picture is going to be right here. I was in a helicopter with some senators. We were up there on a long weekend observing. And the pilot says, how close do you want me to get? I assure you I was not this eloquent, but that's a 30-story building high. Those are 10-story high cracks. And if you walked down here under a 30-story building and you looked up and you saw a 10-story high crack, how close would you get? <laughs> I said, move it out a little. OK. <laughs> So, so at any rate, and what happens if you wait there long enough is this, right? So here's the 30-story the high thing. There's the Lincoln Memorial. And here's the piece breaking off. 
right? This is already sticking up about 50 stories. You're going to see a 50 story high splash, right? So here it goes. Right, that's a 50 story high splash. I'm gonna run it backwards. This is so cool. I'm sorry. I can just sit here and do this, right? We'll run it forwards again. Um, it's just phenomenal. This, these things make earthquakes and you can hear the earthquakes here, right? Magnitude five point something. And so, so it, it, they, they break off, right? And there's the Lincoln Memorial again, okay. Um, but what it does now is it breaks off and then it waits a while and then it breaks off and you can fly by in the helicopter and usually it doesn't get you. Um, and, and so, but you know, if this piece, this is a funny plot, so this is Antarctica, the flying buttresses are in cream, the gray is areas that if you took the ice off would be land, it's above sea level. And all the color is areas that if you took the ice off, it would be below sea level, so it can make icebergs, but it also can raise sea level because it's too thick to float. And what we're worried about is this piece right here called Thwaites Glacier. And if Thwaites backs up a little, then everything in here in color will go. And back in here, it would have a cliff that's way, way higher than that one in Greenland. And higher cliffs can break faster. Right. So we tried to do a little programming. I worked with, with Dave Pollard and Rob DeCano. They're fantastic uh, computer modelers. And we tried to say, OK, suppose we take this and we say when it gets warm enough, it acts like Greenland. And then how warm is warm enough, we let a little bit of the history of the ice and sea level inform that. So we just said, when it gets warm enough, this acts like Greenland. And what happens then is once it gets warm enough, which may be 50 years out, plus or minus 50, um, then it takes very little time to get rid of all of that and raise sea level up here about 15 feet. Okay. Short time scales. All right. And they've actually, they sort of said, we won't let it fall away too fast, but it could fall away faster than they did. So if you ever go look at their numbers, they're not a worst case scenario by any means. And so we might, by late in the century, be expecting this much and get, you know, that much. And if you think about what it costs, a little bit of rise, they call it nuisance flooding. But at some point, you've got to build a wall or abandon it. And then the wall has to be stronger if you make it higher. And so the costs probably rise faster than the sea level does. Right? And, and so, so let me do something for you. Right? I do not have to commute by car. But you might know somebody who has to drive to the city. Right? So I want you to think of some poor schmo who's a commuter. And this is how much problem they have, and this is how likely it is that they have it. And what's the life of a commuter? You get stuck in the car, you're stuck in traffic, you turn on the radio, and it's boring. Right? What is the best thing that can happen to a commuter? There's no traffic, and, and, and you, know, you get the Beach Boys Festival. Right? That doesn't happen to you. You get stuck for an hour, and they're testing the emergency broadcast system. Right? But there's somebody out there that just got run over by a drunk driver, and that's why you're stuck in traffic for an hour. And we know that the most likely thing is the way on the good end of what's possible for a commuter. And what do we do? Right? We buy a car with airbags and crumple zones and anti-lock brakes, and now they have these new radar systems. We put the kids in child seats. We support mothers against drunk driving. We have police looking for the drunk drivers. We have highway engineers making the roads safer. We spend a lot of our transportation budget on things we don't expect to happen, because if they do, they're just so bad. And we do that, right? And if you start asking, so if you use this, in your economic model, it says we will be better off economically if we invest to head off global warming. And we're not now doing that according to those IMF reports. And yes, there is uncertainty. The future might be a little better than that. It's possible. But we might dump West Antarctica. We might do a lot of things that are surprising and could be very, very costly. Okay, now, I, 
was in a congressional testimony not that long ago. And I sort of said, here's what we know, and we use this, we're better off. And then they had someone who said, oh, couldn't it be better? Uh, this is what we know, couldn't it be better? This is what we know, couldn't it be better? See, we heard both sides. Okay, no, no, <laughs> okay. There's more room to argue with somebody who's really alarmed than with somebody who isn't, okay? So let me close up. Under the usual assumptions, efficient policies that reduce CO2 improve the economy, as well as employment, national security, ethics, and environment, okay? If the economics are uncertain, then you tend to do more to reduce. And then you get into all the uncertainties in the science and they point the same way. There's this possibility of ice sheet collapse. There's possibility of other things that could be very expensive. And so investing to head those off becomes valuable. And so economically, using our knowledge is good and improving that knowledge is good. So I'll leave you with a picture I took in Greenland. Can we have a world with icebergs and rainbows? Yes, we can. Thank you. Questions? It seems like whenever we get actual reports of what's actually happening, it goes along with uh, it's worse than predicted. And I was wondering whether that is because uh, science tends to underestimate rather than overestimate because of political pressure. Yeah, I, I suspect that we are careful. So if you did not hear, the question is, do we underestimate our, our risks? And I suspect that we are indeed cautious. I, I think that sort of overstatement is considered very bad. But I think mostly it's actually this, that if you put up a best estimate of what we expect, and then you throw darts at all the possible futures, there'll be more of them on the bad side than on the good side. And eventually, this just comes down to the fact that it's easier to break things than it is to build them. And so, you know, I, I started you here. What does it take to build this? What would it take to break this? I could just throw it at the wall, right? It's easy to break. And you start thinking about, could we build the Garden of Eden by just raising CO2? Probably not. Could we break things we care about? Probably yes. We expect every serious analysis that I know of says that high CO2 will make plants happier because it is plant food. And that's built in. We're expecting that we're not as more alarmed because CO2 will make plants grow better. And maybe it's even a little better than we're expecting. But you can't make plants grow infinitely fast because of CO2. People sometimes add a little CO2 to a greenhouse because the plants grow a little better, but not a lot. And so most greenhouses don't. But if it gets too hot, your plants die. If it gets too cold, your plants die. If it gets too wet, your plants die. If it gets too dry, your plants die. My dad used to over-fertilize my mom's flowers and kill the plants that way. Uh, if your pollinators don't show up, it's as bad as the plants dying, you don't have a crop. If the invasive smut or the invasive virus or the invasive whatever comes in, you lose your plants. So what do you expect? It could be a little better, it could be a little worse, or a whole lot of them die, right? It's easier to break than it is to build. And so the, the waiting tends to be on the bad side. And so if you then say, okay, is it what we expected or is it worse? Usually you'll get worse. And I think we just need to remember that, that the best estimate is often well on the good end of what's possible. Yeah. I'm wondering uh, long term what you think of possibility that we could pull billions of tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, and does talk of that concern you because it then yeah. gets us off the hook with CO2 right. emissions reduction? Right. So I think technically there's no doubt that we could pull billions of tons of CO2 out. 
Um, if you think what goes in now to our fossil fuel system and all of the fracking and all the oil wells and all of the tankers and all the pipelines and all the gas stations and all of that, you'd think of an infrastructure that was similar or a little bigger because the CO2 is bigger than the oil is. And so whether we'll do that whether anyone could take the actions and get it together politically and invest in it. Right now, the assumptions, the economic models tend to say that's easy because your grandkids are rich and they can deal with it. So you'll find a lot of models that when you say, find us an optimal path to not get too hot, they put the CO2 up and then let our grandkids take it down again. But, um, but would they do that? And could we possibly, once you start taking it down, you now have to agree where you're going. And so somebody, you know, would, would Russia and Uganda get together and say, we want to take this much out to get to this temperature? And is that a plausible future? And my, I have some friends who are hydrogeologists. And you know, if you put a poison in the groundwater, you can take it out. You can pump and treat and sparge and all these other things. But if you actually ask a serious hydrogeologist, what's easier, take it out or not put it in? <laughs> they don't like taking it. They like not putting it in. So I, I suspect that it's actually much easier not to worry about taking it out. But I think we could. And I think if we got desperate enough, we would. At the point where going outside and sitting in the shade, drinking water naked with the wind blowing, and you're going to die because it's too hot, we'll do something. <laughs> yeah? Uh, thank you for being here. It's an honor. Uh, I was hoping for a song, but penguins are just as good. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, my question is about tipping points, because I'm going to Bonn. And they have a big climate conference going on right now, yeah. about two degrees Celsius, and that's what all the policymakers and economists talk about. But I mean, is that really even possible? Now? Right. So two degrees is probably possible. Again, we sort of get there by taking some CO two out. If we got really serious, we could probably do it. But we're getting close. Um, Tipping points, I, I served a little bit. Uh, Bill Nordhaus and I served on the first academy panel that looked at abrupt climate change at tipping points, and then I served on the second one. Um, they probably are physical ones. That ice sheet is probably the most important one. There probably are biological ones. You get too dry, the forest burns, and a grassland comes back, and you just lost it, and it might have been the Brazilian rainforest or something. There almost certainly are societal ones. And this may be what's really important. So we know that there was a paper a couple of years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy. Um, Human-caused climate change has made drought more likely in places including Syria. And we doubled or tripled the likelihood of the drought. A drought happened. Did we cause it? We doubled or tripled the likelihood and it happened. So we loaded the dice to come up drought. It came up drought. Israel did not break out in the Civil War. Lebanon did not break out in the Civil War. Syria, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think it's fairly widely agreed that the last, it was an unhappy place, it lacked resiliency, the drought hit, and <clears throat> Okay, now that was a tipping point. Um, the, uh, there is a dotted line, which some of our military leaders have identified, between heat and drought in China and Russia, and rising bread prices and the uprisings in North Africa. That's a tipping point. And we probably have a lot of tipping points in our societies. And whether economic growth is completely proof against such tipping points, I think is a question that's worthy of further consideration. So yes, here and then, yeah. I was just curious, based on all your experience, if you had like the ear of all the mover and sh movers and shakers in the world, what would be like the three things yeah. that we want to start right now so that we don't get to the really bad. Right. Whether it's engineering or economic programs like the carbon charge, um, things that Bill Nordhaus has worked on. Yeah. What would you want to do? Okay, so what would I do if, if you put me in charge? I'd, I'd, 
uh, you know, I'd give it to somebody else immediately. You don't owe me <laughs> running anything. But, but I think that the first thing, you know, I have been deeply influenced by, by Bill Nordhaus. And the first time I testified to a subcommittee of the U.S. Senate, it was chaired by a Republican who really, I believe, wanted me to scare the heck out of people so that you could use a, an economically conservative approach to this by putting a price on emissions. So rather than trying to, to outlaw things, rather than trying to regulate things, rather than trying to squeeze the balloon, you just put a price on and let it go. And I, I've heard this enough from, from Dr. Nordhaus and from many other people that across all the serious economists I know, they like a price signal as the best way to do this. Um, and then I think you spend a bucket load of money on engineers and applied scientists who are going to solve the problem and this is going to be electric grids, and it's going to be better solar cells, and it's going to be windows that collect solar energy, and it's going to be how do we integrate um, batteries in public cars into the storage system, and it's going to be all the, the things that... Th the evidence is clear that we can build a renewable energy system, that it will power everyone essentially forever, that we'll get rid of all these side effects, it will end up in an economy which is better in an environment that is better, that can give everyone the energy that we now enjoy. And the transition to that is going to be a pain in the butt. And, you know, when we transition from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers, it sort of took us 10,000 years. When we transition from being hunter-gatherers of energy to being farmers of energy, we can do it in 30 rather than 10,000, but it's going to be a pain in the butt. So I'd, I'd fund that. And then I'd probably... I don't know, my third one, if you gave me three, whether it would be artists and, and people, whether it would be sort of getting us back to we can do this and we can make the future better, uh, educators who can tell the good news as well as the bad. Um, but I also, maybe these tipping points won't happen and funding our community of scientists to tell you how much to panic about the future could buy you a little time. And so I suspect it's a broad, area of community and purpose building that includes some knowledge. But, but get started on the solution space and get started on the price signal that makes that solution. You know, on the scale, like I said, on the scale of panic about global warming to do nothing about global warming, what the reports say is we're over here on make it go fast. <laughs> uh, yes. And then, I believe it's true that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 50% above what it has been. Right, so carbon dioxide has raised from sort of 280 to 4 and a little bit. So yes, we have raised it. It seems to me that the temperature rise that's been claimed is way less than that amount of carbon dioxide. So the statement is the temperature rise has been way less. In fact, the models are doing beautifully. So if you go back to um, early work, you go back to, to Hansen 88, yeah. you go back to a bunch of things, we're spot on. The reason that we haven't seen so much rise is right now a huge amount of heat's going in the ocean. And so if you turn up the heat in your house on a cold night, you start heating the air and then immediately it loses heat into the walls and the bed and the furniture and it takes a while to warm it up. We're way less than where we're headed. We, we are committed to more warming than we've had. Yes, absolutely. So we are committed. If we stopped right now, we'd get some more warming, which is why we're so close to 2C already, is that we, we are, you're absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Have you looked at population growth and its relationship to carbon pollution, and are, is it something that you're willing to talk about? Right. So population growth. It is, our impact on the world is impact per person times number of people. And so this is easy. If you want to reduce our impact, you either reduce number of people or you Im reduce impact per person. So there's no question that population growth would be one knob you could turn. Uh, there's also no question that, you know, if we go on an exponential growth, at some point all exponentials have to turn over, right? We're not going to have people standing this way on the whole world. Um, so, so, but there is this optimistic view. Okay, now let me, let me do this, right? So 
what we know with fairly high confidence based on observation, this is not physics, this is not F equals MA, but what we've seen is that people tend to choose to replace themselves and not more if those people have confidence that their kids will grow up, interesting things to do, and some control over their reproductive lives. And if we give that to people, so, so confidence that their kids will grow up, interesting things to do, and some empowerment of women, the projections are that the world population stabilizes. And it stabilizes without anyone doing anything else. So no one has to go in and do a one-child policy or anything of that sort that people choose when they're doing okay. If we don't provide that, all exponentials have to turn over, and whether they turn over that way is a real question. And so the sort of issues, if you want to ask long-term, how, how do we do well for sustainability, uh, health of children, including health of children in the third world, um, helping empower people, uh, education, um, and if one had to choose a bias, my reading of the scholarship is that you have to make sure it gets to women. You have to empower women. And I'm not an expert in this, and I, if anyone wants to jump in, I would, would, would seed, but my understanding is that you have to make sure of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.